Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Parabos webinar. For those of you who are new to Parabos, Parabos is Australia's resource for the control of worms, lice, flies, and ticks in cattle, sheep, and goats. Um, Parabos is a joint initiative of Australian Wool Innovation, Meat and Livestock Australia, the University of New England, and Animal Health Australia. Today, we're going to be talking all about lice across um, multi species. So we're going to look at the latest in management for lice and how to use the Parabos tools to help you manage lice. And we're joined today by Dr. Jane Morrison, who I'll introduce to you in just a short moment. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Today's presentation is recorded. Along with all of our other webinars, you will find the recordings on our YouTube, YouTube channel. So we will have a Q&A tab, you will see that in your Zoom control panel. So could you use the Q&A tab, please, to ask, to enter all your questions that you would like me to ask Jane for you on your behalf. We're going to have ample time following today's presentation for a good Q&A session. So please use the Q&A tab for questions. And if you're having any dramas or problems, use the chat tab and I'll keep a monitor on that as well. If you put your questions in the chat, I may miss them. So please use the Q&A for all your questions for Jane. Just have a quick poll to get us started, which I'll launch for you now. And it should be coming up. And it's what is your role in industry? Cattle advisor, sheep producer, education, other goat producer, multi-species. And then also the second part of that is where are you from? Queensland, New South Wales, ACT, Victoria, South Australia, WA, Northern Territory, Tasmania, or international. <clears throat> the polls are very helpful for us here at Parabos. It gives us great feedback, but will also be very helpful for Jane because I'm going to share these results on the screen in a moment with you all. And then Jane will be able to get a bit of a feel for who we have on board today. So we're about three quarters of the way through getting all the data in. Let's give it a moment longer. Okay, I'm going to finish that poll up now and I'm going to share the results on the screen for you. So they should be coming up. 11% cattle producers, 30% advisors, 17% sheep producers, 9% education, 26% other, 4% goats and 4% multi-species. And then where you're all from, we have... Queensland, 9%, New South Wales and the Australian Capital Territory, 43%, Victoria, 19%, <clears throat> South Australia, 13%, Western Australia, 13%, 2% from Tassie and 2% from overseas. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'll close that poll off now. And we're now ready to start today's presentation. So I'll invite Jane to stop sharing my screen and get Jane's screen up for you all. And while we're doing that, I'll just give you a little bit of information about Jane. For those of you who don't know Jane, she grew up down in the areas of southern New South Wales on both sheep and cattle property and worked started her career working as a mixed practice veterinarian for about 11 years. And then she moved on to Cooper's Animal Health, where she's been working as a technical veterinarian for the last 18 years or so. Her main interests and passions are in sheep and cattle diseases and in parasite prevention and management in order to maximise welfare and production for our livestock industries. So it's great to have Jane on board. She's um, a little bit crazy about lice. So, <laughs> you know, we need a few people in the industry like that. So we've got the right person on board to talk all about lice today. So welcome, Jane. Thanks for joining us. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Fiona, and thanks everyone for joining. I'm assuming that my screen's showing in the right format. Excellent. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. And as Fiona said, I am a little bit mad about uh, lice and I'll explain a bit why, so hopefully I won't seem quite as um, crazy. Oh, now it's not gonna move. What's it gonna do? There we go. Um, so as Fiona said, I am a technical veterinarian for MSD Animal Health and our, our key brand that you'd all be familiar with is um, Cooper's. 
um, which has been around for a very long time. Um, but today I'm just here really talking about sheep, uh, sorry, lice in general. So we'll cover everything. Um, uh, sheep lice is probably the one most people um, want to know about, um, sheep and goat lice. Um, but I did notice there was a few people on here from um, with cattle producers. And so we'll also cover cattle lice and it's quite a pertinent time of the year to be talking about cattle lice because this is when um, we're really going to see it. So we'll cover a bit about lice. Um, we'll look at cattle lice and goat and alpaca lice. Um, and then we'll also look at sheep lice and a bit on lice boss and what's available there to help you manage uh, your lice problems. The, the key thing about lice um, is that they're very host specific. And one of the things uh, I guess that leads to why I'm so intrigued by them is, is they're actually probably the easiest creatures to kill. Uh, they don't like hot, cold, wet, dry. They, they were very sensitive to environment and have very low tolerances. So they like it to be a particular temperature, a particular humidity, um, or they'll die. Um, so they should be really easy to kill. Uh, but the problem that we have in getting rid of them is that they're very hard to find. And that's where, you know, sheep lice is probably the one most people talk about because they're particularly hard to find uh, in the fleece of a sheep. Um, they've got lots of places to hide from, from chemicals. Um, so they are quite an interesting little creature, but they're, they are host specific. So cattle have cattle lice, sheep have sheep lice, goats have goat lice, alpacas have alpaca lice. Um, lice can only eat the particular, so they, um, most uh, lice are biting lice, so they'll eat the dead skin cells and some of them are sucking lice, but they can only survive off the food from their specific host. And the other thing that's specific about them is they'll have um, different little feet. So the way that they manage on the fibres. So obviously, you know, a wool fibre is quite different to that fibre that's on a, a cow. Um, and so they'll have different uh, legs and body shapes to make sure that they can survive in those environments on those hair fibres. And the same human lice are completely different again. Um, and there's a few things that we should always remember um, about lice and, and, and when we're trying to control them. It is that they are sensitive to the environment, um, but that they also are very slow breeders. Um, so the life cycle, that one that I've got up there is actually the sheep life cycle. And it takes 35 days for an adult louse to lay an egg for it to hatch, go through the nymph stages and become an adult. So that's quite slow. Um, if we think about some of our worms, like barber's pole worm, which is in both sheep and cattle, it can do that cycle um, in about 19 days, which is a lot quicker. Um, so they're quite slow developing. The other thing about them is that they don't lay very many eggs. So they only actually lay two eggs every three days. So they're not even laying an egg a day. Whereas again, with our barber's pole worm, they can lay 10,000 eggs a day. Um, so they can go around their cycle in 19 days and lay 10,000 eggs a day. So that population is gonna build up really, really quickly. But when we think about lice, it's a 35 day cycle and they don't even lay an egg a day. So that population is gonna build up really slowly. And when we talk about in sheep, that's really important to try and figure out where the lice came from and how we're gonna get rid of them because you won't see the sheep lice population until four to six months after they've been infested. It'll take that long for the population to build up to a degree where you're getting that rubbing and derangement. The other thing about lice is they will only spread from direct contact. So whether we're talking about cattle or goats or sheep, the animals have to be in direct contact for those lice to spread. They can't exist off the animal. Um, they need to be protected from the environment. Um, and so that it's only when they're yarded or when they're camping together at night that they'll transfer from one animal to the other. Um, it has been shown with uh, sheep that lice can persist in the fleece in a shearing shed protected from the environment if the fleece is on the floor um, for up to two weeks because it has access to sheep skin cells in that fleece and it also is protected um, and, and warm in that fleece. Um, that being said, um, wool lying around the shearing shed, small amounts aren't a risk. It, it's a big sort of fleece over in the corner where it's protecting it. And generally, you have sheep, in the, if they're in the shearing shed, are not going to be in contact with that pile of fleece. So it, it's not really a risk, but it, it can persist there. Um, lice won't persist on a fence or in trees or in bark or on a crow or an ibis or starling or anything else. Um, they will die you know, within an hour, probably won't even get onto those animals anyway. So it really is an animal to animal contact that causes um, the transfer. So if we just have a look at the impact of lice and it, it does um, you know, vary across all the species, 
Um, the thing, you know, cattle, it's um, all of them, it's about welfare, but with cattle, I guess it's more about welfare and damage to infrastructure. So it doesn't generally impact the production um, in cattle. Um, it's more about a hide value, the welfare of them, because they're constantly rubbing and scratching and the damage that that does to fencing and, and other things. Um, whereas in sheep, it's a lot about production as well as welfare and predisposing to fly strike. It causes a significant derangement in the fleece if we've got um, wool producing sheep. And it'll decrease the, um, the clean fleece weight by up to 18% and decrease the value by up to 20% to have that cotted fleece and lice infestation. So there is much more of a production issue there. Um, goats, it's a welfare and irritation um, issue as well. Obviously with your mohair and cashmere um, goats, it's, it's a much more production um, impact in those goats as well. Whereas your meat producing goats, it's a bit more like the cattle. It's just, it's the welfare and it's about rubbing on um, infrastructure. Um, alpacas, again, it's going to affect um, the fleece quality um, and that irritation and rubbing um, as well is gonna cause issues for those those animals. Um, so the, the impacts are sort of the same across most, but the production benefits are really in those um, uh, wool producing sheep um, and in the mohair and cashmere. With cattle, um, it does impact on the value because of that, that hide and the appearance. If you're going to sell cattle with lice, um, they will certainly be reduced in value. It doesn't affect their production, um, uh, so they'll, they'll still gain weight. We'll talk about why cattle get lice, and that usually is because um, they've got some other underlying health issue, which could just be nutrition. And that, of course, is going to be affecting their production rather than the lice itself. Um, so is it actually lice? So lice are really small, uh, but they are visible to the naked eye. Um, that said, if you wear reading glasses to read, you're probably going to need reading glasses to find lice. So they're visible to the naked eye as long as you've got good eyesight or um, uh, help your eyesight with some glasses. Um, you also need good light to see them because they are quite small. Um, so I wouldn't look for lice in a shearing shed or in a, you know, where it's shady. I'd make sure that we're out where we've got sunlight. And the, the two reasons for that are when you've got lots of light, things are easier to see, but also that will make the lice move because they don't like light. So they will try and move away from the light. Um, and something that is tiny in millimetres that is moving uh, is a lot easier to see that something that's shining that's sitting still and, and mixed in with some dirt and other things in the in the hide or the fleece. Um, so it is important to have good light and good eyesight to see them. Um, with sheep lice, if they're rubbing and um, you, you will find the lice if it's lice causing the rubbing. If they're rubbing and you cannot find lice when you do the proper partings, which we'll talk about, then it's not um, lice that's causing them to rub. So it can be other things. Um, even in cattle, it can be mites. Um, it can be grass seed, fleece rot, fly strike. It can be dermo and rain scald or a break in the fleece. And um, so it's not always lice. And, and cattle, if you can't find the lice, um, it's probably mites that are causing the issue. And so the treatment for that is different. Um, and so it's important that you actually look and make sure you find the lice and confirm that that's what the problem is. Uh, certainly in sheep, grass seed uh, is a massive issue as is our fleece rot and uh, fly strike. And that can appear like um, they've got lice, but in fact, it's just lots of grass seeds that are penetrating the skin and making them rub. And you'll see in the uh, pictures there, the one at the bottom is um, a sheep louse and it's got those little dark bands on it because that's an adult sheep louse. The, the juvenile ones will be clearer. Um, and then up on the top pictures, there's some eggs um, from cattle lice and then they're a sucking louse um, for cattle. So they look quite different. Um, so in cattle, we've got four species of lice. Um, we've got Bovacola bovis, which is a biting louse, and then we've got three species of sucking louse. So they actually um, suck blood. That's how they get their feed, whereas the biting louse just eats the dead skin cells. They can be found anywhere on the body, neck, shoulders, rump or tail. They're usually easiest to find when you're looking um, around the neck or the um, tail where you've got a bit more um, in winter, you've got that hair growth or coat growth, and that, that's where they'll tend to hide because they're a bit protected from the elements. The thing about cattle is that during summer, um, you won't really see any evidence of lice. It's when the cooler weather arrives that the lice population will start to increase because the coat of the animal thickens up and provides that protection. So the lice will start multiplying um, and, and those coats really help. 
the animals um, be protected, sorry, help the lice be protected from the elements, um, the same as it happens on sheep with the, the fleece. The big thing about cattle and cattle lice is that generally there's an underlying problem, which means that the, the cattle's immune system's compromised and the lice are, are multiplying and, and their immune system isn't getting them under control. So there's a huge influence with um, nutritional stress um, or some other immunological stress or health status that will mean uh, cattle will show signs of lice. And so you'll, you'll see it more in your younger animals or during a drought uh, when they're all under nutritional stress, you'll see a lot more lice. And so that's, lice is often the key and the indication that yes, it's an issue, they're rubbing on your infrastructure. It's a welfare issue for them to be rubbing. But the next question is, why are they doing it? Do they actually have worms? Am I not feeding them enough? Um, what's the, the weather conditions? And so we need to address that because those other things will be affecting the production of the animals. And there's a lot of debate in um, cattle lice about the value of treating um, because it's not a, a direct production impact. Um, but it does have an impact on welfare and on hide value and value through the sale yards and it's definitely um, worth treating them. And as part of our um, um, assurance programs um, with our NILS program and our um, LPA quality assurance, um, it's a requirement that you do treat cattle for cattle lice because of that welfare component. So it is important if they have lice that A, you treat them and B, you find out what the underlying cause is and try and um, deal with that as well. So in many seasonal areas, like where I live in Yass, um, the cold winters usually have, um, you know, limited nutrition and poorer nutrition because we don't get a lot of grass growth. Um, most winters we're probably feeding some hay. So there is that added underlying thing going on and that's where you'll tend to find um, you get regular lice problems in those areas. Some other areas may only um, get lice problems you know, during a drought where they've got nutritional stress for other reasons. Um, some areas where you get a really wet season and so you've got a lot of rapid growth of the grass and it's low in protein, um, you might get um, nutritional issues there, which then can lead to lice. Um, if they're really well fed healthy cattle, they don't tend to develop a heavy infestation and, and get that rubbing going on. So it, it's just important to always look at that underlying uh, issue and make sure you're trying to deal with that as well as treating the lice and relieving that itching. Um, so when we're looking at lice control in cattle, um, it is a very seasonal thing. And you'll see from that graph on the side that the numbers over the summer autumn period are really low. Once you get that first cold snap in autumn, your numbers will start to increase and they'll peak in that winter. And then as we come and warm up going into um, spring and the animals are shedding their winter coat, so exposing those lice to different elements, then the population gets itself pretty much back under control. But it's during this peak season here, um, late autumn and through winter, uh, that we ne really need to be monitoring what's going on. Um, you've got to consider what chemical you're using um, and what other non-target species will be affected. So it's really recommended that if you're treating for lice, you select a product um, like a delta methrin poron that really only acts on the lice. You, you can use um, mectin uh, drenches, and they will also control lice. But if you're using an injectable drench, they'll only control the sucking lice, not the biting lice. Um, you can use those, but it's not recommended unless you're actually trying to control worms at the same time. Because what you'll do is you'll actually be exposing the worms at a time when you don't want to be. And so that's going to increase your chances of developing resistance in the worms. So if you're treating for lice, try and pick a product that just treats for lice and doesn't treat for worms. Unless, of course, you're doing it at a time when you want to treat for worms at the same time, then you could use a combination product. But just remember that your injectable worm um, treatments in cattle won't treat the biting louse, just the sucking louse. Um, and we need to think about what stage of the season it is and therefore, you know, what product we might choose um, and think about reinfestation uh, through the introduction of um, other cattle during the year. It's really important when we're using chemicals to follow labels and the PPE requirements and be aware of our withholding periods um, and make sure that we're allowing that withholding period to pass before um, these animals are going to sale. So there's a couple of different treatments. Um, we can look at knockdown treatments. So they literally will just kill the lice that are on there and they don't, um, they'll have some protection, but it'll be more short lived. Um, so your SPs or synthetic pyrethroids, so your delta methrin porons, those sorts of things, they'll give about 
eight weeks protection. So they'll knock the lice out that are there and give that short-term protection. So if you're treating with them, you know, in the middle of winter, then they're going to get you through the season until it starts warming up. Uh, mectins are much the same, so your MLs. Um, so they will give you about that eight weeks protection, but they do also target worms. So unless you want to be treating for worms, you're best avoiding those um, so that you're not inadvertently um, causing resistance issues in your worms. There is organophosphate treatments as well, so OPs. They have a lot shorter protection and generally on the label, they'll require that you retreat two to three weeks later. So they're less popular probably for that reason with that shorter protection, but sometimes, um, you know, people will still use them. Then we've got what we call prolonged protection or IGR treatments, and that's an insect growth regulator. So it doesn't actually, diflobenzone is the active in those, and it doesn't kill adult lice. What it does is um, it affects the juveniles and anything that hatches from the eggs, and it, so it stops them developing into adults. So the adults will die off naturally, um, and then the young ones obviously will be controlled by the IGR treatment. So this sort of a treatment can actually give you protection through that whole cold season, you know, the season long protection, that whole sort of four or five months that you need. Um, but it's best applied at your first cold snap in April and May, uh, before you notice the lice, and then it'll hang around on there the whole time. And as they try and build up their population, it just keeps knocking them on the head. Um, and then eventually all the adults will die off within sort of 20 to 40 days anyway. Um, so it's a really good treatment to use at the beginning as a preventative. Um, and then if you end up with lice, then that's where you go back to your knockdown treatments. Um, there are poron sprays and ear tags. The thing with ear tags is you need to make sure that you're removing them after three months because their level of chemical will drop and that increases the chance of resistance developing. And just like with the mectins, we've got to consider worms. When we're using ear tags, we need to consider buffalo fly and the impact we're having on that. Um, and how that's fitting in with your rotation of chemicals in buffalo fly control, because we don't want to cause resistance in our buffalo fly and have them exposed to lower doses of these ear tags. So it's important to always think, I want to treat for lice, but what else am I going to impact? Uh, and that will help you make the right uh, decision on what chemical to use and when to use it. And yeah, just a reminder about the injectable MLs only controlling the sucking lice. Um, so that was pretty much it for cattle. And then we move on to goats and alpacas. Now, unfortunately for goats and alpacas, this is about all I'm going to be able to give you is just one slide. Um, and the reason for that is there's not a lot of available registered treatments. There are none registered for the treatment of lice and alpacas, um, and there's only one registered for the treatment of lice in goats. Um, so goats will get two different, uh, sorry, three different sorts of lice. So there's two biting lice and a sucking louse that they'll get. The only registered treatment available for goats is a diazinon spray, and you do need to respray it 16 to 17 days later. So diazinon is an organophosphate, um, and it does have a milk withholding period of 48 hours. So it's the only product on the market that's registered, and it has a milk withhold period. So for those people with milk goats, um, and that's the only option that you've got. Um, there are off-label products that you can use, but you need to speak to a veterinarian, um, and they can prescribe a treatment um, under their veterinary license for you to use. Um, with alpacas, um, there's only a biting louse in Australia because the sucking louse um, were actually eradicated with quarantine imported treatment requirements. So we don't have sucking louse in alpacas, only the biters. Um, but unfortunately, there is no registered treatment. So if you want to control lice in alpacas, you'll need to, again, speak to your veterinarian about an off-label use, um, and they can prescribe you um, a chemical to use and make sure they're guiding you on the the correct chemical, when to use it, and the dose rates on that. Um, so certainly um, speaking to your veterinarian is the best way to put a plan together for your goats and alpacas and lice. So then we'll move on to sheep lice. Um, now there's quite a few sheep people on the call um, and quite a few advisors. I'm not sure if they're advising on sheep or cattle, um, but sheep lice is a huge um, problem in wool producing breeds. Um, it does cost an awful lot of money to the industry. Um, so whether we're talking about crossbreds or uh, merinos, particularly merinos, obviously it costs a lot, um, but it also has a significant impact in crossbreds. But we need to remember that shedding breeds are also sheep. And, and whilst their fleece has no value, um, so there's no real impact of lice, they absolutely definitely carry sheep lice and sheep lice will live and breed on shedding breeds of sheep. Um, so they can carry and spread lice. 
uh, it just doesn't impact them uh, in any production issue because their fleece is worth nothing. It just falls in the in the paddock anyway. And the other big difference with them is because we said, you know, um, lice are sensitive to environmental tolerances. So because they're constantly shedding their fleece, there's really nowhere for those lice to hide. So whilst they'll definitely have a population of lice potentially on those um, shedding breeds of sheep, it'll never build up into a massive population because every time they shed, they're exposing those lice to the environment and some of them are dying. Um, so their population is moderated by the fact they're shedding their fleece. Whereas on your wool producing sheep, that doesn't happen. There's this beautiful environment that we keep for them in that fleece. And so that's when they'll get, you know, their numbers will really build up and get out of control and cause issues like you can see in that picture there where we've got significant derangement. Um, the thing about sheep lice, and, you know, I said right at the start, they're really easy to kill and they are, but they're very difficult to find because we're looking for these tiny little things all through that fleece and they don't move around and travel all over the sheep. They just stay in one little area. So the, the, key, the key thing we're trying to do when we're using chemicals with sheep lice is we're trying to make the chemical find all of the lice. The lice will not move around that sheep and find it. So that can be really difficult to do um, when you've got lots of long wool, um, which is why traditionally off shears treatments have been the way to go. We will talk about in a, in a slide or two, there's, there's been a major development recently in sheep lice control where we now have an oral treatment and that's going to make a big difference um, to how we treat lice and how we look at lice because it can be used in any length of wool um, because it's been given orally and we're not relying on the chemical to transmit through the fleece. But one of the key things with um, sheep lice is this point that I've got up there that it's estimated 70% of properties will fail to eradicate lice with a single treatment. Now. There's 30% of properties that can do it and it's not their chemical choice that's making that difference. It's management uh, concepts that they've got on farm and, and how they're managing their sheep and how they're managing their sheep lice program uh, that makes the difference. So the 70% that fail to eradicate it, it's because to eradicate lice, you need to treat 100% of the sheep 100% well in, in a single treatment. And that's really difficult to do. And we have a lot of properties where we're not getting full musters um, because they might be pastoral properties and their fencing's not as good. Um, and they've got a lot of bushland that they're not mustering out of. So it's important that every sheep is treated 100% well, and that's quite difficult to achieve in any given year. So it's very difficult to eradicate lice in a single treatment. Um, on some properties, it's almost impossible to eradicate lice because you can never get a clean muster. But on properties where you can, it's still going to take you probably three years to eradicate lice because in any given year, there's going to be some little hiccups. So it takes three years to really knock that population down and get fully uh, rid of it and eradicate it. Um, but it's all about management. It's about having a single treatment in the year. Um, we'll talk about the key things that it is. Um, Neighbours are usually blamed. Um, but they're often not the issue. And for every neighbour that you're blaming, I can probably guarantee that they're blaming you um, because, you know, lice will go backwards and forwards and it, it's not always uh, just a neighbour's issue. Um, certainly it can be. And if there's poor fencing or, um, or if sheep are going backwards and forwards all the time, that's, that's definitely an issue that needs dealing with. But some of the other reasons are these miss sheep at muster or at treatment. So they might be mustered, but they miss the treatment. Uh, lambs at foot, so if we're shearing and treating and we've got unshorn lambs at foot, that's a significant issue, even if you're weaning at shearing. If they're not being weaned to a completely separate property and geographically isolated, someone will get back to mum and it only takes one sheep to be missed at muster, one sheep to miss a treatment or not be treated well, or one lamb to get back and you'll reinfest the whole lot. And it's really, really difficult to make sure that one is never missed. So purchasing sheep, including rams, um, failure to eradicate a previous treatment because you ha it hasn't been treated properly. Split shearing is a big one. So it, to get rid of lice, it's one treatment, all sheep on the property at one time. Uh, split shearing makes that difficult, whether that's, you know, two different lots of sheep you're shearing or you've got unshorn lambs at foot. Um, and lambing use. So when they're lambing quite close after treatment, you need to make sure they've got four to six weeks and we'll cover that. So you need to find the lice um, to know that it's lice. So lice need about 2,000 lice before they'll rub and they need about 2,000 lice before you'll be able to find them. So you can look at 10 sheep um, and do 20 partings on a sheep, 10 centimetre partings. Um, and if you find lice, 
then lice is the issue. But if you've got sheep that are rubbing and you do those partings and you cannot find lice on any of those 10 sheep, then lice is not your problem. That's where you're going to look at itch mite, grass, seed, fleece, rot, dermo, something else. And remember that it takes two to six months for that population to build up. And when we're looking at these 10 sheep, uh, don't just knock the first one over and go, okay, well, I found lice, so I've got lice. You need to actually look at all 10 sheep and you need to count the lice. And when I say count, oh, not really accurately, but you need to get a concept of what, how many lice each of those 10 sheep have. Because you might find you've got eight sheep there that you can't, you can find lice on them, but there's not even one louse in every parting. So they're less than one louse per parting on eight sheep. But then the next two sheep, they've got so many lice in each parting that you can't count them. And so what that's telling you is that these two sheep with all those lice have actually reinfested the whole mob. So whilst yes, everyone has lice and it is a disaster and you need to treat the whole lot, when we're trying to figure out where did they come from, we need to be thinking about these two particular sheep. So were they missed at last treatment? Were they introduced? Are they actually the neighbour's sheep? You know, who, who is there? Who are they? And why have they got so many lice? The other eight sheep, they've just been reinfested. So whatever you did last time probably worked on those and they've now been reinfested by these two. So it's important to get that pattern. Um, and it's important to even look at how many um, adults and juveniles. So have you got a really advanced population where you've got lots of these adults with the little stripes on their backs, like in that photo? Or is it a really new population where you've got lots of nymphs and young lice, so those little clear ones? And that sort of gives you an indication, you know, was it two months ago that you got this lice? Or was it six months ago because you've got a really mature population? So looking at that sort of information really helps you work out how long you've had the lice, what the potential problem was, and make sure that when you're putting your lice control program together, that you're dealing with these things and, and blocking the right hole. So knowing where the lice came from or having a pretty good idea is going to help you make sure that you can get rid of it from there. If we don't work that out, then you'll do what you did last year and you'll be back here again. Um, so it's really important to get that timeline estimated. So when we're controlling sheep lice, the key things are every sheep has to be treated at the same time. So every sheep on the property, whether it's a ram, a lamb, a killer, or whatever it is, a shedder, if it's a sheep and it's on the property, it needs to be treated. So that's sort of like an annual strategic treatment, um, if you are treating annual, where everything gets treated at the one time. You need to have complete musters. Um, every sheep needs to be treated correctly. You should never mix treated and untreated sheep. Remember I said it takes about 2,000 lice before you can find them. So you could treat some sheep and then mix them with untreated sheep. But in fact, those untreated sheep could have up to 2,000 lice and you don't know about it. So then they reinfest the treated sheep, not the other way around. So you really should never be mixing treated and untreated sheep. Um, you need to read the product label and figure out how long it's recommended to use before lambing. Um, most products, your backliners, they'll be six weeks. This new oral product's got a four week period before lambing. So you need to make sure you've got that time. Otherwise lice can persist on the ewe, then infest the lamb. And then when the chemical drops on the ewe, the lice will go back and reinfest the ewe. So you'll just make this little circle where the lice keep going around. Any sheep you bring on, you have to assume that they have lice and that includes rams or anything that you buy bring it on and treat it for lice. So they need to have a quarantine treatment for introduced sheep. Um, and make sure when we're using our chemicals that we're rotating chemical groups and not product names. So uh, with something like imidacloprid, which we all sort of know um, as Avenge, which was the original one, there's now, I actually don't know how many, but there could be, you know, 10 of them, um, a lot of generics. So whilst they have a different name for the product, it's the same active imidacloprid. So you've got to make sure that you look at that. And thiocloprid and imidacloprid are essentially the same thing. So it's not a rotation to go between those. So you've got to make sure that you're looking at your chemical groups and rotating those and not product names. The impact of shearing. So we used to say traditionally that the only time you could get effective lice control would be off shears or short wool. And the reason for that is because when you shear, you're removing um, up to 70% of your lice and then a heap more of them are dying from exposure because they don't like hot or cold. So depending on when you're shearing. And so you're then actually only chasing about 10, maximum 20% of your lice population and it's in the smallest amount of fleece. And so that's why traditionally you're off shears and short wool products were the only time you could achieve eradication. We've now got a new active and an oral delivery method, and it does remove that restriction of having to tie effective lice control to shearing. 
um, it does mean that you can now treat effectively for lice in any length of wool. Um, and it also helps overcome uh, the clean shearing issue, which we know a lot of people aren't happy you know, with their shearing, but particularly if they've had lice and they've got cotting or they've got dermo in the, in the fleeces, um, that's quite a challenge to get clean shearing uh, and that can really impact the um, tropical chemicals, your backliners and your dips and their ability to control lice. So shearing does control a lot of the lice um, and we can potentially still use that as a non-chemical control in a program, um, but we're no longer restricted to having to do our, our treatments at that time. But if we have a look at all the chemical treatments that are available, um, so we can use dips, plunge and cage dips um, or shower dips. I'm not a big fan of shower dips. It's very difficult to um, achieve complete saturation because they do need 12 minutes and they need more than 230 kilopascals in those dips. And I don't find very many, if any, that have that level of pressure. And it needs that pressure to be able to penetrate to the skin and make sure they're wet to skin level. Uh, plunging cage dips can certainly do it. And traditionally they've been considered the gold standard for lice treatment. Um, because they do help overcome the issues um, of poorly applied backliners or poor shearing and, and cotted fleeces uh, when there's been a heavy burden. Um, they do need complete sat sat saturation, sorry. Um, so if you're doing a swim through dip, they need to be nine metres long, they need to be in it for 30 seconds and they need to get two dunks backwards and down. Um, in a cage dip, they need two four second dunks um, and time between where they're sort of half standing up um, and, and in that uh, dip solution before they go back under. Um, there's various chemical groups you can use in these dips. So you can use OPs, spinosin, neonicotinoids or IGRs in your plunge and cage dips. Um, you can use OPs, spinosin or IGRs in your shower dips. Um, you can't use the neonicotinoid in a shower dip. Um, and just remember with your OP, that's actually temophos. Um, you cannot use diazinon uh, to dip sheep any longer unless they're being done through a dipping dynamics dip um, because that company has a permit approved by the APVMA to use diazinon. Um, so dips, the thing I've always said about dips is there is a thousand reasons not to dip. Um, it's really an onerous job. There's lots of problems that can happen afterwards, but there's always been one really good reason to dip and that's it's very effective at lice control. Um, now with the oral treatment coming into the um, into the toolbox, um, you know, that's going to be an option as well for very effective control without the need for the, um, the backliner and that really accurate um, application. Um, so that's going to be an option as well to put in that rotation. So then if we look at backline treatments, the thing I always say about backlines is they're convenient, they're not easy. If you ask people why they use backliners, they'll generally say they're easy and, and I do disagree. <laughs> they're very convenient um, because you can do them straight after shearing. So compared to dipping, very convenient, um, but they're certainly not easy to get right. Um, you need to make sure that they're pole to tail, that they're applied exactly per the label, that there's chemical that's going to run both sides of the sheep. You treat one sheep incorrectly, that's going to reinfest the whole mob over time. Um, so the backline treatments, you can eradicate lice using them, but you have to make sure 100% of the sheep are treated 100% well, and that's not easy to achieve. Um, and you make sure, you have to make sure you're topping up your paint job and that that stripe is um, covering everywhere it needs to. Because as I said before, the lice will not run around the body and find the chemical the chemical has to find them. So if you only put the stripe down one side of the sheep, it will not travel up and over the spine and down to the other side. So that whole side of the sheep hasn't been treated. Um, and it only takes one sheep in the whole mob for that to reinfest. So it's not easy, um, but they are convenient to use as an off shears treatment. So the chemical groups, we're pretty lucky with that in backliners. We've got a few, we've got the mectins, we've got spinosin, we've got your neonicotinoids. So your imidacloprid and thioclopid are essentially the same chemical group. So it's not a rotation between those. And then we've got OP. So there's a diazinon high volume spray as well that you can use in the backliners. So there's plenty of option there for your rotations. And this one's a new one. So when I did this talk, I don't know, last year sometime, not that long ago, um, this didn't exist and now it does and there's a very happy little lamb there. Um, so we now have an oral treatment that's recently been registered and is um, going to be available in the market shortly. Um, and the beauty of this treatment is given orally it works from the inside out. 
And so it's effective control in any length of wool. Um, so where traditionally long wool treatments were just really holding the population until you could shear and treat, with the oral treatment, it's an effective control. So you'll get as good a control at any length of wool as you will off shears. Again, you know, it's capable of eradication, but it has to be used correctly. So it doesn't eliminate the need to treat 100% of the sheep 100% well. Um, all of those things are still a requirement, making sure you treat all of the sheep that you quarantine. So all of the principles of lice control remain the same, um, but we're now able to actually do that effective control in any length of wool. You've always got to apply it as per the label. Uh, treat to the heaviest sheep in the mob and make sure that you're weighing them or have a good idea. Um, one way if you're not weighing them is to have a look at the last lot of cull sheep you sold and how much they weigh. Generally, they're probably not your heaviest. So if they're weighing 65 kilos, the sheep that you've kept behind might be 70, 75. Um, so make sure that you're having a look and that you're correctly dosing. And, and that goes with um, the backliners or the oral um, to make sure you're correctly dosing. And make sure you're treating every sheep. So with the backliners, you could see the marks on their back when you were treating them. So you could check that uh, before you let them out. With an oral treatment, there's no outward sign. So what we're recommending is that you mark them with a crayon on the head um, as you drench them. So you drench them and you just crayon um, onto their head so that if you get a phone call or need to get out of the race because something else happens and you need it elsewhere, then when you come back to the race, you can see I've treated those because they're marked. I know I need to start here with these sheep. Um, otherwise you won't know where you're up to and you risk missing one sheep. And when we're drenching sheep for worms, if we miss one sheep, which we do know happens, um, it's not such a big deal. If you miss one sheep when you're treating for lice, that's a big deal because that sheep will reinfest your whole mob. Um, so we're really recommending that you do mark the sheep so that you know you're treating them all. Uh, the chemical group that's available as an oral is a isoxazoline. Um, the active is called fluorolana. Um, some of you will be familiar with that uh, from Brevecto in dogs. So it has been um, around and, and used for parasite control for some time, I think since about 2014. Uh, but this is the first time it's been available in sheep. Uh, so backline and jetting uh, long wool treatments. So obviously they're still available as well. Um, and they, as I said before, they're a salvage treatment. They're basically to reduce the population, get you through to shearing, and then you can shear and treat them all at the one time. Um, now, I, I guess people will be considering using the oral treatment as a long wool treatment, and they're actually going to get effective control rather than just holding it back. Um, but there'll be plenty of times where we're still using these uh, backline or jetting long wool products. Um, and they're available, the backliners are available in an SP or a spinosin, and the jetting is spinosin or ivermectin. One thing to be um, always remembering when we're using long wool products is don't use the same chemical group that you used at your previous treatment. So if you used um, a spinosin off shears and now you need to treat for long wool, don't use a spinosin again. Maybe go with an ivermectin as your long wool. Um, and then you could use your spinous and again as your off shears or vice versa. So make sure that you're not using the same chemical group um, as a long wool backliner as you are as an off shears one. So make sure you've got that rotation in season if you're still using those products. Um, so lice boss, as Fiona said, there's lots of um, information on there. There's loads of information for sort of pretty much any question that you've got. Um, when you go on to lice boss, you know, there's lots of um, topics up the top there about lice, preventing lice, monitoring and treating. And in the treating, you can go down and look at your application methods, the products, um, the chemical groups, um, how you're going to control use and lambs, all those sorts of things um, are available in there. So I recommend that you um, go in there and, and use that resource to get further information. Uh, just looking at the time. Right, so quarantining purchased sheep, um, it's really important. You don't, sheep can have 2,000 lice before you know that they have lice. So assume that any sheep you bring onto your property has lice, because if you don't do anything about it, you could infest your entire flock with lice. I um, mean, that's going to be a much bigger issue. So now there's, I guess, two options that are preferred for quarantining. So traditionally, the recommendation was that you shear and treat all sheep on arrival because to get effective control you had to shear them. So you could still do that now or you could use the oral lice product, uh, Fluorolana or Flexalt's um, its uh, name, but you could use that as your quarantine 
uh, treatment now because they don't require shearing. And then you need to um, make sure that you don't mix them with your home flock. Ideally, you'd never mix them um, until everyone's treated at the one time, but you've got to allow that um, four week period before you would mix them. But just remember that if you actually have lice at home, then you just go and infest those ones. So it goes around and around. Um, so when you're using something like quarantine treatment, if we think about that as a, a tactical treatment, then there needs to be at some stage in your calendar um, where you do a strategic treatment and treat the entire flock to make sure that we abide by golden rule number one, which is treat all sheep at the one time. Um, so you could do that when you're doing your quarantine, treat your whole flock, including the ones that are there, or you could quarantine these ones on the way in and then at some later period that suits you better, you could treat the entire flock, including the new ones again, to make sure you're abiding by that, that key rule of all sheep at the one time. Unshorn lambs at foot are a huge issue in lice control breakdowns um, because they're, they're often not shorn, often not treated, or if you are treating them traditionally, it's been with a long wool product, so there's been some compromise. So the best options with unshorn lambs at foot now are to use an oral product on the ewes and the lambs, which you can use down to six kilos. Um, so that's one option. You could shear and treat oil, ewes and lambs at the same time, um, or you could shear the lambs four weeks or less after the ewes and dip them all at the same time so that they're all being dipped two to six weeks off shears. So there's a couple of options. But the key thing is you need to treat those lambs if you want to eradicate lice and not with a long wool product, but with a product that's going to be effective. So either the oral or you shear and treat the lambs or you shear the lambs at slightly different times, but they all get treated in a dip at the same time. Some backline products will have claims for unshorn lambs, but it is only to a certain age. Um, and that age is usually uh, about two months, I think is the most any of them have. Um, and all lambs being treated have to be under two months. And so that doesn't usually happen. Um, once you know you've got lambs at three months or there's a couple at four months, you're compromising your lice control um, and you're not going to achieve um, eradication doing that. Um, you can treat the lambs with a backline long wool product uh, that will help mitigate the risk, but it's definitely uh, a compromise to a control program. So you won't be getting rid of your lice. Um, and as I said before, make sure if you're weaning, they're geographically isolated. Uh, one other thing just to remember is to also consider the impact that you're having. Like with the cattle lice, we talked about the impact on buffalo fly and worms. When we're talking about sheep lice and sheep blowfly control, make sure you're thinking about what's going on there. So some actives will have action on both flies and lice. So your mectins, your neonicotinoids and your spinosins will act on both the flies and the lice. And whenever you treat for one or the other, you are also exposing the other parasite. So you could be creating repeated exposure in the parasite you're not actively trying to treat, um, or you could even, some of them have different doses between lice and flies. So you could be giving a sublethal dose to the other parasite. So always consider every chemical you use, what else is it impacting and how is that going to affect and uh, develop or make resistance worse in one or other of those parasites. So it's something to be um, really, thinking about whenever you're using a chemical. What else? I'm doing it for this parasite. What impact is it having on other parasites? So it, the golden rules, treat every sheep at the one time, ensure every sheep's treated correctly, don't mix treated and untreated sheep, quarantine and treat arrivals, make sure you've got that four to six weeks pre-lambing depending on the product, have stock proof fencing and rotate chemical groups and not product names. There's um, a link there to the Parabos website. Um, you can Google search lice boss as well. There's loads of information on for sheep and cattle lice in there. Um, and I believe there's also some for goats, but obviously it's limited because without veterinary advice, there's only one product you can use. Um, there's a treatment decision guide. There's some treatment tools. There's lots of really good information on there. So um, make sure you go and, and have a bit of a look. Um, and that's me done, which gives us, I did rush that, but we've got 10 minutes for questions, Fiona. Great job, Jane. No, I didn't think it felt rushed at all. And I always learn something new listening to you. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. We do have quite a few questions that <laughs> have come through, which is great. Um, first question, does the new oral, great question too, treat both sucking and biting lice? 
Uh, it does, uh, but sucking lice aren't really a significant problem in sheep. So when we're treating sheep lice, we're usually always targeting the biting lice. Um, the sucking lice are really only the face and foot louse um, or the scrotal louse. Um, and they're not around a lot because generally we're uh, drenching sheep and there'll be a mectin active involved in that drenching at some point. Um, and that's pretty much controlling our sucking lice anyway. So it will do both, but uh, sucking lice isn't a huge issue in, in sheep. Thanks, Jane. Um, will the new oral be available in WA at the same time as the Eastern States? Yes, it'll be available across Australia at the same time, which um, will hopefully be about mid-July. Um, comment here. Uh, I use 16% sulfur plus allicine lick blocks. Does this block help control lice on cattle? Um, I guess that would depend on whether that producer thinks it is controlling the lice on their cattle. It won't control biting lice. It may have an impact on sucking lice, but I don't believe it has a claim so um, I, I would think potentially not but it may I don't know anything about it thanks um Jane I actually have a question with the new oral do you have to treat it as you would all the other chemical groups and rotate it along with the other groups um, yeah, so rotation is always important. It doesn't matter, you know, what, what chemicals we're using, I think. Um, yeah, on that slide at the top there, um, with, with sheep lice are interesting because they only live on the sheep. So there's no other sort of population of them hanging around or any lice. They're, they're always on the animal. Um, and so when you give an effective treatment, you, you should be killing all the ones on that um, animal at the time. And so then they, the ones that they get re infected with will generally be from a different population or not as exposed to the chemical. So we don't find that you need to rotate as regularly as you would with a drench. So every three or four years is probably an adequate time frame just to dip out, make sure that you bring a different active in there and, and come back. So it, it is definitely going to be important, but with sheep lice, it's not as important to do it really regularly. Um, and so it would be important not to constantly use the same chemical. So you wouldn't use the oral as your only go-to. Um, you'd make sure that at some point you're bringing in something else. So you might do um, a fly control. So if you have to do another lice treatment, you might use a fly control that does flies and lice. Um, so you might use one of the ivermectin jetting products and that's going to break your cycle of the fluorolana. Um, so it is important to keep rotating, uh, but it, it's not, with sheep lice, we don't have to rotate every year. It, it's a less frequent rotation than we're using with um, uh, worm drenches, just because the population is slower and it, it only lives in one place on the animal. Thanks, Jane. Um, is it okay to use automatic jetting races for long wool, e.g. with ivermectin? Ah, is it okay? Uh, will you get effective control? The answer would be no. So the, the jetting races are very good for blowfly control. Um, they are not Oh, I don't even know where I'm going now. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I was trying to get back there. Um, so jetting races are quite good for fly control. Uh, they're not great for lice control because to get lice control, the chemical has to reach skin level and they have to be wet right down to the skin. When they've got long wool and they're going through a jetting race, uh, a lot of those sheep will not be getting wet to skin level. Um, so it'll be still impacting on the lice, but it won't be getting as many of them as it could. So it's a less effective way, it will help, um, but it's certainly not recommended because you might be giving that sublethal dose. Um, it's quite good for fly control and it's good at just holding back. There's a number of pastoral properties that will use um, ivermectin jetting as their second treatment because they don't get a full muster and, and they've just got to try and control their lice um, and they can be effective for that, but they're not a recommended way to use a long wool product. You won't get the best result you can out of it. Thanks, Jane. Um, the next question um, will be delivered to me. So I'll repeat the question though. I won't type an answer to it. Um, will the Lice Boss tools be updated to include the new oral product? 
Um, great question. And the answer is yes, that is currently underway. And is the website up to date on the new chemistry? And yes, it is. So thank you for that. Uh, skipped ahead too far then. Let me come back because we have quite a few questions. Um, a few thank yous there for you, Jane, and great presentation. We love positive feedback here. Um, for sheep lice transmission, um, should you also consider shearers if they've come from someone else's lice infected property? Yes and no. Um, so they're a low risk um, and it depends on a, on a few things. So uh, sheep lice will live in their moccasins because moccasins are generally warm, moist and have sheep skin cells in there. Um, the easy way to prevent that being an issue is to either microwave or freeze uh, the moccasins um, when they come onto your place. I'd recommend having a separate microwave to your lunch one, but anyway. Um, so you can easily eliminate the moccasin issue. Um, as far as on their clothing or anything else, though, the, any lice that were on them from the day before, I mean, maybe they'll change their clothes, but it probably wouldn't really matter because those lice will die, you know, within an hour. So they're not going to transfer from one farm to another. Um, if they go straight from a lousy farm uh, to your farm, then yeah, there is a chance that on their clothing there, there could be lice. I think the risk would be almost zero, but I guess there could be some risk. Generally at shearing time, that's not going to be a risk because when the shearer contacts the sheep, they're shearing it. So they're actually removing the lice rather than putting them on there. Um, and then the sheep are generally going to go outside and be treated or the environment will kill any um, of those new lice that get on there. The time it could be an issue is if they're moving between sheds uh, when they're crutching because those sheep are generally not being treated unless you're choosing to use the, the oral. Um, and so the, and the lice could quite happily live on there because they could get in and burrow in. So I guess if they're going from one shed to another within the same day, there would be a very, very minimal risk um, at crutching. Um, at other times, there isn't a risk. The moccasins would be really your only risk and that's easy to eliminate with microwave or freezing. Thanks. I don't, think, I, I don't think I've ever, come to the conclusion that shearers have spread lice. So it's pretty low risk. Um, if using the new oral treatment as part of your quarantine treatment, <clears throat> how long would you need to keep your purchase sheep isolated from your existing sheep on your property? So the first thing I'll say is never mix treated sheep and untreated sheep. But when we move past that, um, it's, so basically it's the time when we say pre-lambing. So it's that four week period. You'd need to keep them isolated for four weeks. Um, but as I said, there's no guarantee that the untreated, unless they've been on your property for a couple of years and you've never seen signs of lice and you know they're definitely lice free, um, then you know you could mix them in and it'd be that four weeks later that you'd do it. Um, but at some point you'd, you'd want to treat all sheep at the one time just to make sure. Um, will the new chemical control other parasites such as worms or blowflies? And second part of that question, because they're quite similar, is is it true that it can't be given at the same time as a drench for worms? So to answer the first question, no, it doesn't control worms or have any action on blowflies. So it's purely acting on sheep lice. Um, and to the second question, um, at the moment, we're conducting some studies on using a drench at the same time. So we're currently not recommending that you use the two at the one time um, until we know that that's okay. We just wanna make sure it's not gonna impact on the drench or impact on the last treatment. So we're doing those studies to be sure. So at the moment we're saying, don't do it. Um, not because we know it doesn't work, just because we don't know whether it's okay. So we're finding out whether it's okay. So that'll come out in the future. Thanks, Jane. Um, do you have a likely release date for the product? Yeah, that's mid-July, hopefully. Um, and have any trials been done on goats at this stage? Mm, no, they haven't. It's all been done in sheep. So there's been 15 trials across Australia in sheep. I say across Australia, but unfortunately there are none in WA because they were all done during COVID and WA ran their own country during COVID, unfortunately, so we couldn't get in there. Um, so everywhere else across Australia, there's been trials in sheep, uh, but there hasn't been any work done in goats. 
Um, and last question, I, I think it's the last question. Oh no, still a few more. Um, uh, any potential, the new product, any potential effects that it could have on ticks? I think we, we covered that specifically for worms. Um, so we haven't looked at ticks at all because ticks aren't really a thing in sheep, although I do understand in some areas they are an issue. Um, the, the active itself we know is active against um, ticks in, in dogs and cats um, and, and other species, but we wouldn't know the dose that would uh, work against ticks. So we, we really don't know if it's the right dose. The dose is set to do sheep lice. So we don't know if that's the same dose for ticks or if it needs more or less. So we don't know about ticks. I have a producer here who puts a sponge with food dye on the end of the drench gun to easily ID treated sheep. Would this be okay? Yeah, any way that you identify them is completely fine. Great. Let's check last minute questions. Thanks everyone. Nope, that's all done. Thank you everybody for your questions. Just going to switch our screens over really quickly before we say goodbye to Jane. Just a reminder to everyone that we have a follow-up survey. The link will appear in the browser at the conclusion of today's webinar and it will also be sent in a follow-up email. It's five really short questions. So I thank you in advance for your feedback. And next webinar will be on the 11th of July, 2023 at 1 p.m. The Silent Killer, High Dadids in the Australian Cattle Industry with Matt Playford. So looking forward to that one. So thank you very much, Jane, for joining us today. It was wonderful to have you back on the Paraboss webinar platform. Thanks, Fiona, and thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope you got something out of it. Thanks. Bye for now, everyone. Bye.